Uh, together we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you are all now members provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex, Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual noviceship. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens us and excites us and makes us hungry for more. And now let's give a warm Curiosity Club welcome to Ben Falcon. All right. Thanks for coming, guys. Uh, so today, I'm just going to talk generally about painting bicycle frames, and uh, I'm, I paint currently at Chris, uh, Chris King, uh, Cielo by Chris King, but uh, I'm going to focus more on just, because I've worked at other companies too, so we're just going to focus on generally painting bikes, but we've got the Cielo here and everything we can look at afterwards closely, and some examples of sample tubes and whatnot, but um, generally I'm just going to focus on uh, just painting a bicycle, uh, different materials as well. So we've got, as far as materials go for painting bicycles, is usually there's steel, aluminum, titanium, carbon fiber. Those are the main ones, um, or at least the ones I've done, had experience with. So, um, so starting with steel, uh, steel is the one, if obviously there's corrosion involved with steel, so uh, it has to be painted no matter what. Whereas other materials like titanium and aluminum uh, don't need to be painted as much. So. Uh, so yeah, so we'll start with steel. We've got, we start with a, a bare steel frame. We start with the bare metal right after welding. And um, usually they clean it up with some kind of finishing techniques to kind of deburr all the areas and whatnot. Um, just clean it up ready for paint. So I'll take it and prep it, basically, which just involves sanding down any, any uh, little imperfections or raised portions in the steel, because we want to lay down a nice coat of primer over the entire thing. So. For steel, there's usually two primers, uh, an etch primer, like an anti-corrosion kind of primer, like this, which is a very opaque, I mean a very uh, translucent kind of thing. You can almost see through it. Um, and then usually there's an uh, epoxy primer over that. Now, I'm using a water-based system now, where we just use this uh, right on top of the bare metal. So if this tube was bare metal, then this is just the next step. So I just want to prep that and clean it. And apply this coat, basically. Uh, or you could do this method as well and put the etch primer or the epoxy primer over that. So this is just, this stuff is really uh, sticky stuff. This is just clear and color right here, so I don't have any of the primer, but these are just some containers to show you what it looks like in the, in the paint booth. But, um, so this stuff, everything sticks to, it's just a good uh, base layer for any kind of color to go over, and then you have your clear on top of that. So that's the general order of things. So, and you guys can pass this around totally. It's just, it was clear, it was a uh, prime today actually, so it's kind of, uh, it's totally dry, but uh, it's pretty fresh, so. So after the priming process, then we go to coloring. And, um, sorry, these are a little bit out of order, but. So we got, um, basically just, you'll put down a first color. Um, wherever you have any kind of decal work, basically. Uh, usually I paint on the places I've worked, which is Seven Cycles and Cielo. We both, we paint it on decals usually. So I'll just kind of, uh, usually you go by order of lightest to darkest color, because you want your layer white down first, and then have other colors. It's easier to put a darker color over a lighter color than vice versa. It's kind of harder to get that hiding with that. So, um, We'll kind of lay down color wherever I need to in each, each of these areas. And then after that step, you want to put the mask, the masking, whatever you, you know, don't want to get covered up in the next process, uh, down. And then spray the next color. So this, this tube, um, I would have sprayed white first and then laid down the Cielo text mask and then sprayed gray and then taken that mask off. And so that's what this is. And there's also some, I'll pass this around too, there's some vinyl decals on here, which is actually, uh, you know, the vinyl masks where this text came from. And same for those and everything. So 
we have a vinyl plotter that cuts out masks from Illustrator, uh, whatever we want, and I just you know, pick them and, and weed the little the vinyl, which is very meticulous and frustrating. But um, <laughs> So those go down, and uh, so you can kind of see this is how this bike would have worked with a, a clear coat would be the next step for this one uh, on a two color scheme. And then you can also see the vinyl masks that are used to actually make that. So, so yeah, and then, so this is, these kind of bikes right here, this is just in mid process. You can see it's rough and dirty. You've got, I've already masked off a color here probably, and there's another color there, and I'm just in the mid process here. And the next step would be just to unmask all of this and then clear it. So, uh, so this is kind of what bikes look like when they're in mid process color, very messy tape everywhere. So, um, this kind of thing. So these are carbon fiber frames. This is, I mean, to, to kind of switch gears to another, I mean, it, painting bikes is all pretty much the same, but uh, there are serious differences in the materials, and carbon is probably the biggest one. So steel is uh, fairly easy compared to carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is the only problem, the only main difference is from the other materials is just much uh, more porous. So you have a lot of imperfections in the carbon, which requires a lot more surface work, basically, a lot more prep work before you actually prime it. So a lot of Bondo, um, that kind of thing. So a lot, a lot of Bondo. And every, like for anyone, like cars, I mean, so many things are being made out of carbon fiber these days. And like I used to, I used to paint them and be like, you know, this is awful, like who would do this? And everyone that does it, it's, it's just an industry thing. It's just, it always, it's awful, so. So I, I felt better about that, but um, but yeah, it's just that's just how the material is to paint. It's uh, it looks very nice, and especially when these kind of amorphous kind of uh, shapes and you know cr the crazy things you can do with carbon fiber. How this is just uh, you know these kind of curves and whatnot. But uh, to get that to get that to be perfect is just very difficult for sure. Mm -hmm. So um, with the carbon fiber, when you're putting the bondo on it, are you how do you how do you take the, how do you shape the Bondo to the carbon fiber? Isn't it, I guess my, my question is more about like, does that, I mean, how do you avoid damaging the carbon fiber by scratching it or? Right, um, well, it's, it's actually, it's so, it's such a coarse material that it doesn't really matter. You can sand, oh. sand it a lot. So okay. you basically. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. definitely. What we're feeling here, is that mm -hmm. vinyl or is that paint? Oh, the white? Yeah. Oh, the white one, that's an actual ready, that's ready to clear, basically. So that's just paint. Cool. So, so yeah. So the vinyl has been removed mm -hmm. as a mask. But what about the rest of it? The rest of it is vinyl. Yeah, the rest of it's that, it's that translucent kind of green vinyl. And that can be any color. It just happens to be, oh, actually, I've got some right here. So, oh, cool. so this is like a big one for a mountain bike, um, a new size for what we're doing. So it, vinyl can come in all different colors and, and sizes and whatnot. Uh, this translucent green one is one that's particularly good for, or they say it's particularly good for, uh, for water-based paint. So we've been using that. So they all cut out, they're all different thicknesses of vinyl, basically. Is this so, a peel away on it to the pieces underneath? Yep, yep. Now that one, I mean, I couldn't use because I put that transfer paper on the back of it too. Right. But uh, that's, the, that's exactly what I would use to put on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then I would just remove it from the backing and then place it on the bike, kind of, uh, use a squeegee or just your fingers to kind of rub it down and then take the trash paper right off. So, so that's that process. Um, so yeah, that's that's it for carbon fiber. But uh, it's just just to know it's a pain, basically. <laughs> but this is what you get, basically, which is nice. I mean, you get something some crazy stuff like this, you know, where you can a very uh, so yeah, it's very shiny. So then you get into more, uh, so more carbon fiber here. You can, another thing with carbon fiber that's nice, you can have that bare carbon, um, just have the clear of the carbon and then kind of fade it into colors and whatnot. I like this one. Uh, you have this blue fade into the carbon here. And then some, some detail logo work outside of it. So that's something people like a lot, especially in modern bicycles, is to kind of see that carbon. Well, I think if you're gonna have carbon, it's nice to actually you know, know it's there. Same thing with titanium. So, so that's one thing there. So getting into more, yeah, you can see more carbon here. Um, so getting into more advanced kind of color work, it's just basically like these I've been passing around, except you know, a lot more steps involved. Um, <laughs> as you, I mean, you take this with three colors, 
uh, and you multiply it times whatever, and uh, it's just a lot more cutting out masks and weeding vinyl and whatnot, and uh, a, lot, a lot of different layers. And as you get to more colors like this, you have to think a lot more about the process of which color I'm gonna put down first, and what mask I'm gonna put down next, and then and which makes the most sense to do. Because if you do it one way, it, can, uh, it might not work. So you have to kind of pick the right route where it doesn't involve a lot of back masking, like going back over things you've already done, basically. So there's usually a right way to do it, and it takes a while to think about, but, but yeah. So you can get a lot of really detailed work like that. This one was one of my favorite ones I've done ever, I think. It was a, a guy who had a, it was a memorial ride, a memorial ride for his dad, and um, he gave me like a, a PDF of something he designed, and he was just like, go to town with this, you know, just design it. And that's, that's the most fun, really, for painting bicycles, is when you get someone who just, you know, gives you a design and kind of lets you run with something, just like a tattoo artist or whatever, you know, someone who can just have confidence in you to, uh, to, uh, do your own thing, so, so yeah. But, um, and then this, on the other end of the spectrum, there's this, which is uh, much more process-oriented and uh, production-oriented, for sure, like, as far as efficiency goes. But um, still, a lot of, still a lot of detail work, obviously. And uh, it's more, more of a classic um, kind of aesthetic than the stuff I was doing at Seven, for sure. This is more people just could do whatever they want, and, and they did. So, uh, let's see what else we got. So you can actually, we'll talk about the gun next. Be a good idea. So this is pretty much what we use to apply everything. Um, it's just an HVLP gun, and uh, just runs into a, an air fitting here, usually a, a high flow fitting, and then you just runs off a compressor. Uh, somewhere else in the shop outside of the booth. If it, since booths are usually explosion proof and you don't want to have the compressor in there. So you've got <laughs> <laughs> these kind of things. And um, so I just ha I basically take, I have a different one for primer, uh, color, and clear. So you've got some pictures of guns here somewhere. Did you say explosion proof? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Maybe the. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, things that inside the booth have to be explosion proof. That's what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not explosion. Okay. But yeah, I mean, you, do, you don't want to have certain things in there or whatever, because, yeah. So, so a compressor is probably, or probably not explosion proof in most cases. So, so yeah. <laughs> but, um, so these are, this is just a typical wall in a, in a paint mixing room, basically. And so you'll have just a lot of dirty guns, basically. Some of them are primer guns, some of them are color guns, some of them are clear guns. And you can, be, you know, change little things like this so you, so you know which one's which. And you have them all kind of set up to the right things. There's a, so there's an air, there's a liquid control right here. This is the main one. And so I can control how much, how much liquid comes out, basically. And then, but that's used in tandem with the air control right here. So if I have it open all the way like this, then all of the air is coming in. As I close it down a little bit more, it's blocking that air. And so you'll get more of like a speckled kind of thing. And so for certain effects, you, you might want that. But normally you just run it with it open. So those are the main adjustments on the gun. And there's also the fan control right here. So this will open up the fan if I turn it back. And so it'll spray a wide fan. But for bicycles, usually it's just, you don't need that. I mean, these are mainly, we're talking about these, all of this stuff, everything I'm talking about is basically for automotive. Like that's what started this, that's the reason it's here. I mean, that's kind of where this stuff comes from. So, so everything we do is, so it's kind of a struggle at times to, to adapt that to a new medium. Um, so bicycles is a totally different thing. I mean, uh, just obviously a lot more you know, smaller diameter tubing. Uh, we're not talking about big flat surfaces anymore. So there's a lot of overspray you can get going on the bike. Um, but uh, normally you want the fan to be very, very low, obviously. So you, don't want to, you want to minimize that overspray, otherwise you're just wasting a lot of paint. Um, so yeah, and uh, you guys can toss this around. So those are the main things. That I have. Yeah, so the air, the, uh, the liquid will come out of here. These little holes over here kind of control the fan. They just kind of spray out air uh, to control it in either direction. And there'll be different kind of cups, obviously, on top of it. Um, usually I use a larger cup, a plastic kind of cup with a suction in it. 
So you can actually turn it upside down and it'll use that suction to kind of, so I can just do whatever. So yeah. And that's, th these are uh, pretty top of the line guns from Germany. Uh, there's all, all different kinds of, so I like these. These are the only ones I've used. But um, yeah, so those are the guns. And you can kind of see a little dissection here if you were to take it apart, uh, which might uh, probably fall everywhere. But, but here's kind of what happens. You've got the needle in here, which when you're pulling the trigger, it just kind of releases backwards. And then you've got a spring and, and the uh, air control right, the liquid control right here. And then the nozzle, and then you've got the nozzle cap and the cup. So, so that's pretty much the anatomy of that gun. Oh yeah, there's a good one. <laughs> I think that's just on a on a table. I just painted some little lines. So <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, so that's what happened there. I was planning for this apparently, like <laughs> two years ago. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that table's a mess. <laughs> some more crazy color work you get. Um, just kind of. I think this is a guy at Auburn who who graduated from Auburn. So it's, like, it's the Auburn Tiger or something. So. So it was like copyright infringement, but okay, so, so stuff like that. Um, you can get really intricate with, there's, this is a tie and carbon frame. So you've got titanium here, titanium lugs, and then carbon fiber. And I just painted on top of the carbon and left some bare carbon. So I think this guy just had to do something, something crazy. <laughs> so I did, and it took forever. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and then you get more standard stuff like just flames. A lot, of, a lot of popular frame flames there. So that's just a, a bare titanium frame right there, which is pretty much just the same as a bare steel frame. So that's what I'll start with in the booth. And these are just the filters in the background. There's also different kinds of booths. This is a, a side draft, um, which has had an intake filter over on this side, or a, yeah, and then the outtake filter over here. So we just draw it through this way. And the one I use now, it's yellow, is a giant, gigantic thing. It's a side, side down flow, basically, and it's big enough to paint it like a train in. So, so the air just comes down from the top and filters down through the side. So it's a lot, it's a lot cleaner than, than this booth ever was, actually. So it's, it's nice. But uh, so all different kinds of booths. This is just what I've happened to use. Um, you can see how dirty the filters kind of get. You got to change those once in a while. So yeah, and usually I'll just use basically a bike stand like this, you know, it's taller, uh, but, but yeah, same kind of thing. Just a repair stand that would be in any, in any uh, bike shop, and they get really messy too, but uh, you just kind of use that, and there's all different kind of ways to hold them. You can hold it by, well, either here, or there, or, or the seat tube, so, so bottom bracket, head tube, or seat tube. Uh, I like to hold it by here, but different companies do different things. Um, I like it by here just because um, if you hold it by here, you have a lot of, it slings around a lot, and depending on how much room you have, that might not work. So this way you have a nice center of gravity right in the middle, so it's kind of manageable. So, so yeah. Um, how long does it take to cook? Um, all right, so, so primer, I'll usually just do, um, for the process I'm doing now where it's just this epoxy primer, um, and this can be all different colors too based on what color went up on top. But, um, so this is just one coat. Uh, you only have to do one coat, really. I just kind of, you want it to be smooth, really. You want the texture to be smooth, so you just kind of spray it until you can get it smooth, really. And you can do two coats if you want, but uh, it's just faster to do one. So um, then after that, uh, so you would wait about 90 minutes or so for this particular product. Um, and then you would color it, and the color is this stuff. These are, this is just one of the toners, basically, for the color. And you just basically mix in a lot of these to come up with whatever, whatever color you want. And um, so you'll get, uh, you'll go in the mixing room and you'll make this kind of thing, where you can see kind of different toners. This one has a lot of clear in it, so you, can, you get that nice, I think it's really beautiful, actually. You get this kind of cat eye kind of effect in there, which is kind of cool. But, uh, and then you just, this is before you mix it, so then you mix it and this could turn into some, you know, it's probably an orange or something. But, um, and then, so the color, you usually take six more coats, like three or four, for sure. And for this water-based stuff, it's totally different than what I was using before, which is solvent-based. And this, um, 
It takes a long time to dry and it's very wet and holds a lot of moisture in it. So they actually use an air amplifier, kind of, it's basically just a hair dryer. You could use a hair dryer if it was explosion proof. <laughs> so, so it actually would work better than what I have now because it would be hot air, which would be awesome. But, uh, but yeah, basically it just it blows air out. And um, so you just go over the whole frame after a pan, one coat. Um, and you just want to get it as dry as possible before putting the next one on, especially with intricate masking. Because if you're putting wet on top of something that's still wet, then you're going to get kind of a messy line, which is so important for stuff like this, for little letters and all these intricate things. It's, you really have to get it, uh, get it perfect. So, so yeah, a few coats of that, and then um, we'll move on to clear in a bit, because that's the craziest thing. But, uh, so with the number of frames that you're painting in a day, do you have to have like a schedule for like, do you like, mm. write out or chunk out how long you close, or how do you organize all that time-wise? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good question. Isn't that one of the main challenges that you work with? Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely it. Um, yeah, I mean you get to that point. I mean obviously now with, with this kind of with this company, um, where it's a stock scheme and you have certain colors but choices people can pick, uh, you want to ideally batch batch things. So if I spray I always spray the outline color first for these. So I would spray white first. So if I had a bunch of these with white outlines, even though they were different colors. After that, I would just take all the ones that had white outline as opposed to black outline and spray that down first. And then, that, so that would kind of help efficiency. And you can keep going off of that, you know, until infinity, so. So yeah, but that's that's definitely part of the battle is kind of scheduling that, so. so is there. it like a week for an individual frame? Oh, no, I mean, you can, if you were just doing an individual frame by itself, you can probably do it in a day and then just polish it the next day. But um, it never really works out like that. You kind of want to <laughs> do a bunch. So, so yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, ideally, I think I usually do about five or six frames a week. So, and then, then you've got to keep doing more. So, <laughs> there's always they always want more. That's just for sure. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Let's see. So basically, after that, since we've talked about primer and color a lot, let's see what else we can. Mm. That's most about primary color. So then you move on to clear. Because uh, some of these on here, obviously, you can tell like these are not cleared. Uh, I kind of like the pictures of these better. Just because you clear is kind of distracting in pictures. Kind of a lot of reflections and whatnot. So, But um, the actual clear coat, so it would be the same kind of gun right here. Except I would, for clear, I definitely want to use the plastic cups where I can turn it upside down um, to have more, more mobility with that. Um, so I would, once it was all colored and unmasked, like that tube right there, then uh, we take this. This is the color, the clear I'm using right now. It's uh, supposed to be really tough and uh, scratch proof. It was designed for, it was actually developed by PBG for, um, for Lexus repairs. Because um, people wanted, you know, a really scratch resistant clear to kind of, since that's an issue in auto body paint a lot. So this stuff's uh, pretty good about that. And, um, so you just mix up the right ratio of this and the hardener, which goes with that. And the clear usually hardens up in about a few hours to the touch. Uh, if you force cure it with some heat at about 150 degrees or so, it'll go faster than that. So is it kind of like an epoxy, the way that it works? Like, is it actually a... Um, yeah, I guess, I guess it is. Yeah, because it'll definitely, if you leave it, if I mix it up in a cup and I leave it there, it'll, it'll harden up, you know. The stuff I don't use or whatever, it'll, it'll actually harden into a little puck. Oh, wow. So, and you, it's pretty brittle, but, but it's definitely, it turns into a little puck with the 3M logo on the bottom from the cup, so. <laughs> so they're good coasters and whatnot. So when you're in the booth, like you are now, where the air flows this way, mm. do you move around the frame, or do you move the frame around the booth? Um, well, that, that's, yeah, that's good, um. Like in a, in this booth, it was so small; it might have been this wide. So I would have to, you know, I'd have to move around the frame a lot. But here, I had the luxury of kind of just having this and and just moving this. Uh, they're actually on wheels, the stands. Right. So I just kind of move the frame around and just stand in the same spot, really. So, so yeah. And there's room for about ten frames in there, probably, you know, all on stands. So, so plenty of room for that. So more than you can produce in a day. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll do good, probably. 
As of now, yeah, definitely. So, but as of now, I'm crowning about uh, five, at a, five at a time since we've got five stands, so I'm kind of using that. We probably could bring more in. But, um, and there's also racks in the, in the booth, too, because you're not always doing the same thing to each one. You'll have some primed, they'll hang them up, and then you'll color in others. And you don't want to get any of that color on the ones that are primed, so it's a matter of kind of dividing up your booth as well, which we're kind of in the process of doing, just kind of putting in curtains and whatnot to prevent overspray. So, so yeah, that kind of thing. What's um, well, it's mainly uh, just for environmental standards, really, because everyone's kind of moving, and no one, I don't think anyone actually has yet. I know, I was painting in Massachusetts before, and they should have been the first, but I think they're doing it very soon. But um, I don't think they have yet. Um, but, um, but everyone's kind of doing that because it's going to happen. Um, and there is a lot of, the most of the heaviest regulations are in Southern California. For sure, and I think Oregon's got pretty good ones too. But uh, it's all just going to get crazier, so so it's the safest way to go for sure because everyone likes that. Well, it's got pretty progressive where you work. <laughs> That's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So um, so yeah, it's just kind of the safe thing to do now. I mean, to get OSHA off your back and whatnot. So. So, so do they have a they have a solid base, water base? They have a oil base. Right. Mm. Well, I mean, I guess that would, no, they just call it solvent. It's just all nasty stuff. I don't really know what's in there, but, <laughs> but yeah, they, that would probably be the same thing pretty much. So, but the main thing with the switch was they just, people were skeptical about having the same kind of color quality and matching and whatnot. So they definitely have done that. So it's, it's a different process uh, as I discovered uh, making that transition because mostly because of that drying in between, which is a very different thing. Solvent would dry really quickly. You didn't have to even think about force drying it. So, uh, but uh, obviously you got these are all automotive colors that we use now. Uh, that's pretty much all there is. <laughs> so <laughs> those are the only colors you get. Uh, so we just you, know, you can pick from a, a wild database of anything from all the years. So uh, I think this is a BMW color. Um, <laughs> this one's a I forget. Um, yeah, something but. They're all flashy car colors. So the, the problem is they're all, they're mostly metallic as well because all car colors are metallic. Um, so it's kind of hard sometimes to find a gray. Like for instance, this gray is not even a, a color. It's a it's for the inside of engines. It's for um, <laughs> yeah. It's when they give you the formula, it's to mix it up with a hardener in it that allows you not to clear it because they just use it for um, for engine bays. That's what they do with it. So so yeah, but they still have the formula. So so there you go. But um, as far as, so we're talking about clear coats. Um, the clear is kind of the trickiest part of the whole process. Everything else you can just kind of spray and deal with it as it goes. And if, if something drips uh, in the primer, when you're trying to get that nice texture, you can come back and sand it out, um, usually with like some 800 grit sandpaper, and then you go down from there. But, um, but yeah, with, uh, and the same thing with color. You can definitely get all that out. But once you have the clear, the clear is just what's, you know, it's your final thing and you want it to be really perfect. Uh, you can definitely still polish stuff out because things are gonna happen to it. There's gonna be little dust nibs in there even if your booth is pretty clean. So you're gonna always wanna polish those little nibs out. But, uh, but you definitely wanna get that nice texture because you're not gonna really wanna, you're not gonna be able to change that too much. You've mentioned with carbon fiber that you have to, you know, bond it and other stuff mm -hmm. to a good surface. When you're just clear coating over the carbon fiber, how do you? Oh, just over the bare carbon fiber? Yeah. Yeah, that can be tricky too, because um, a lot of times, I mean, it's pretty dirty. You obviously want to clean it. It's a, it depends a lot about what you clean it with, um, but that's true because there are little fish eyes a lot in the uh, in the carbon fiber. Like in this area, there were always little pot marks and uh, little voids. Um, they're just there's different cleaners that companies like this make, just to. Usually an alcohol-based kind of stuff. I think I did for that for carbon, which was different than anything else I used for anything else. But yeah, you want to get some pretty serious stuff for this, definitely. Um, so yeah, but that was a problem for sure because if there are imperfections in this part of the carbon fiber, which there always were over here in the joints because they epoxy these together, so that was always a mess. But that's why we couldn't. You couldn't even do clear carbon over that because you would have bondo there. Um, but yeah, this you had you had to kind of. Um, play around with it, you'd have to kind of fill it in with the clear, which is not fun. But uh, kind of do light coats over it and kind of just push a little bit of clear in there with some tape or something and then 
put some more over that. So, so that's basically the process with that. And then eventually you get, you get this, but it's not, it's not that easy. So. How many codes so. player was that? Um, was this part? Or, you know, on average? Oh, um, so, so I do two codes clear. Always, pretty much. That's a good way to go, I think. What about over the card player? That would usually be more, um, especially if they're a little, it could, it could definitely be two. But if there were little imperfections, then I have to keep going. going. Exactly. And I could end up putting more over this part than I did over that part. So, Do you yeah. sand between the codes? Oh, no, no. A lot of, some people do that um, do in between clear codes, but it just, it just doesn't make sense for me from a production standpoint. Um, it's a big mess, huh? Yeah, yeah, sanding, sanding clear. I just don't see the point in it, really. I mean, some, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you really want to hide the, because uh, you can feel some of these, and I like that. I don't, I don't see any problem with any kind of tactile uh, experience like that. But uh, a lot of people like to you know, get these so they're completely smooth. And that would involve that kind of thing, where you want to sand in between coats and then add more until you bury that. But, uh, but yeah, I like to keep it. My philosophy is to keep as little clear on that back as possible for, for so many reasons, just uh, especially with details that you have on these kind of frames, any kind of details, you're going you're gonna to lose a lot, a lot of that visual kind of uh, sharpness with with more clear, basically. It always kind of looks, uh, yeah. I see, I've see. i seen like metallic colors before that have like more than one color in them. Mm. How do they make those, do you know? The ones that change they, colors? Yeah, they kind of have like, if you look at it at one angle, it's like sort yeah. of one shade and then another, another Yeah, angle. the iridescent ones, yeah. Um, I don't know at all, really. I've, um, because I know I've mixed them up and they, they're just weird additives, basically. So yeah, it'll be like regular toners like this and then, It'll be some crazy expensive additive, and they won't tell you what's in it. Like, you know, it's, you know, it's something that there you can kind of see it in there because I remember seeing, I remember opening them and kind of seeing them, and it's uh, you can always just see little flakes, and they do kind of just change color. You know, it's just, just how it is. So, so yeah, but it's yeah, that's definitely a thing. And I painted painted plenty of those. I remember that, but uh, but yeah, they'll they'll never they'll never tell you that. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> Have you ever have you ever tried to do any like hand like detail like paint? Oh, um, well, the most we do by that is um, you mean like for for the decals and that kind of thing? Yeah, like if, you know, like I don't know, on a semi truck, mm -hmm. house, sometimes people will do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we'll we'll get onto that soon, actually, because uh, one of these little pinstriping tools here uh, we do use for these, so that's what we do do. Uh, since that since there's no clear with this, this is just one of these. Um, this is just a stainless steel plug right here, and this is this is an ugly one. Uh, this is like a test frame. This was the hardest part thing, thing to do on these on these bikes, but uh, I was learning at this point. But uh, we've got one of these here I can pass around. But this is what we've got now. This is the kind of quality we've we've gone up to now with the nicer polish on the stainless. But um, so basically, I would be filling in that uh, engraving with a little paint I throw in here with a special little hardener, and I just kind of go in there and trace it and let it be, there's no clear over anything. So it's basically the, uh, the, ad the additive that that gray had to make it, so you didn't need to clear it for the engine bay, so. Do you still need to mask the plugs, or? Um, yeah, so there's a lot of, so ba yeah, when you start off with the bare metal, along with cleaning and prepping, that's another part of it, it's just masking all these areas that you don't want to paint on. Um, I use a kind of a powder coating tape, like a high, one of those high temperature rating powder coating tapes. It cuts really nicely in the vinyl plotter. So we just have kind of these stencils laid out just like those where they're the right size, little bands go around for this, for that. Uh, I just cover the whole thing because I don't want to bother trying to paint. Just, yeah, I tried to before, so that didn't, that didn't go over too well. So, <laughs> so yeah, I was just like, no, I'm just going to do an oval there. So, so that's what happens there and then in the dropouts, uh, wherever else you don't want paint. Um, kind of little plugs or tape on the inside of any of these areas and yeah and that's it. So so back to clear, um, for these, for carbon fiber actually you would use a different kind of clear uh, because carbon is very, uh, it kind of tends to bend a lot, especially these joints. Uh, so that's just another example of how carbon is very different. It's, it's a lot of flex in it. So you wanted to use uh, a clear with some kind of flexible agent in it basically. And, and a, a good comparison is a, like Shimano fishing poles. They, they use that kind of stuff because um, you just need it 
for that kind of flux and that, and that material, and it's pretty much the same stuff used for that. So uh, that kind of clear takes a lot longer to dry. Uh, it's, it runs a lot easier. So you uh, you have to be a lot more careful about it. Put it on the pin. Yeah. No, you can, you can do about the same. You just have to, the main thing is afterwards, after you're done, you kind of have to ro babysit a lot. Rotate it, come back, rotate it, and then uh, just you know, remember how you rotated last time and go the opposite direction. Because everything's kind of dripping. And you'll be checking for drips, and if you see a drip going this way, you'll kind of go that way, so. So it clears like that, so. And the color stuff, the graphic mass, masking and stuff, you have, what kind of time do you usually take off of doing the mask? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, let's see. So usually you can do about 15 minutes. 15, 20 with minutes. Yep, yeah, with this stuff. If you if you'd use that air purifier the right way, and you have that completely dry in between each coat, then you should be able to do it in about 15, 20 minutes. So, and then remove, um, and then clear it. So, so yeah. Uh, let's see what else. So you can pass around some of these too. These are just some of the current color offerings we've got here from the automotive colors. So. So just some more examples of some crazy detail work. Um, the kind of detail you can get with this vinyl, basically. And this is what happens when you mess up. <laughs> you get to put stripper on it and, and then uh, start over. Basically, so this would be a titanium frame. Uh, a lot of the frames, a lot of titanium painted frames, people want to show off the titanium, so they'll have part of it painted, and then have a lot of bare titanium. Um, and then, the problem with that is you need kind of a transition from the paint to the bare metal. So we'd use a, a vinyl, basically a, a vinyl that not like this, like a final vinyl that you wouldn't want to take off, that stuck a little bit better and it was kind of you know, durable. So you kind of make a band to make that transition, so. so that's what happens. And these are the some pretty intricate little masks here. You can see, so these are actually colored. This is a colored vinyl. So instead of being painted, I mean, some of this is painted. This is the white and this is the red. But these are actually little vinyl stickers because I didn't want to do all that paint. Oh, thank God. So these are just little black vinyl pieces with yellow vinyl pieces over them. Um, and then you just kind of stick them down in the right order. And the only thing with that is you're going to get a little, you are going to feel it more for sure. And that's why I do, I do really like uh, just the feeling of just paint. I think it's a really nice thing. So I always push for not using decals in any, in any event. But uh, for, this, for this company, for, for this kind of custom work, for the kind of thing people would ask for, you definitely just couldn't always do it, so uh, so I didn't like doing it, but it was it was um, it was easier for sure. So here's just laying down some of that transfer paper that that was on. Actually, you can see it just they're stuck on there, and I kind of just um, push it down with my thumb, and, and then you just kind of remove it, and that's what you get. So you hit it with a clear coat. Yeah, yeah, and that's and clearing over that's not as fun either because you can it's just messier because you have two different materials. You know? It's easier when everything's paint. You can control it better. And this way, vinyl does weird things and decals do weird things. You get bubbles sometimes. So, right. so yeah, that's that's another reason to be a purist about about that kind of thing. But you can definitely and this is as the clear over it now. You can see so so that's the finished product there, and then that transition vinyl from the titanium. I think that's a Portuguese coat of arms or something. So, so you can see this is all cleared, and now we're just putting on, I'm putting on a decal on the bare titanium. So, just a tough coat detail. Are you doing custom like per console with the customer? Um, no, I would. I was. I didn't have an open relationship with them. Um, so that could have got messy. Was it every frame that you painted different though? Yeah, no, that, that was the thing with this company, yeah. They had, I mean, there was definitely some, um, 
some stock schemes. But, and a lot of people did pick those, mm -hmm. but they had the option to pick more, and obviously it was more expensive to do custom stuff. But a lot of people did the custom, the custom route, so. Mm -hmm. so yeah. But I never had to deal with that um, first off. It was always the office kind of, uh, and that's how most places work. Uh, it's just too much for a painter to, to kind of have to deal with that. And they would, I think there would be a lot of yelling. And <laughs> 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 yeah, it's just kind of, you got to keep paint and, and, and the people that want paint separate. <laughs> <laughs> so there's not much understanding between the two. So. Can you describe the, the sequence of this? For that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's, um, so that would be white for, I always do the outline first, um, even if it's darker, unfortunately darker first and then lighter later. So that one works out pretty well because it's just white first. Mm -hmm. And then I would put down that vinyl uh, in this shape for that mm -hmm. text. And then I would put the, the brown, that bronze metallic on the inside. And then, yeah, that's a good question because then I would put a intermediate mask which goes in between this outline. So I have another mask that is just a solid, solid uh, text here. Which you put that on my hand, or you have some kind of a jig that helps you work on that? No, I just, I just gotta, I pretty much just gotta go like this, you know, I go see That's where it goes. Awesome. So, and if there's a gap, then, you know, you're screwed. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you just have to line that up, basically. And then put that down, and then I would put the orange. And then take off both of those masks. So. Yeah, yeah, actually, I would basically, it's just like those last pictures with the X-Acto knife, like it's, that's what I do like half the day. Um, so just like, so it helps to have these higher so I can not kill my back, so. So yeah, it's a lot of, <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's um, a lot of X-Acto knife. There's really just, I mean, I, there's probably different ways people do it, but um, I mean, it's obviously pretty dangerous to get, you know, an X-Acto knife tip close to what you're doing, but I think once you just do it, you realize that's just the best way, so you just gotta kind of pick it up. So yeah, and then removing the mask is always kind of a trick too. I mean, you want to try to do it in a certain way. You, you don't just rip it off. You know, you kind of just get it started, and then you want to usually go in the direction of what you're unmasking, kind of peeling it back instead of just peeling it up or away, that kind of thing. So you want to just kind of pull it, kind of back like this, everything. So that usually ends up being the nicest, nicest masking. So yeah, this is one of the color changing colors actually right here. You can see it looks kind of funky. That was um, called rattlesnake. I think it went from like brown to green. Yeah, a metallic brown to green. So it looked pretty nice and it was clear. But yeah, that's mostly from priming to coloring and clearing. That's that's most of the work. And then um, this is what you end up with, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you so, get it? Um, I I don't know. <laughs> well, no, I do, but I'm just like... I was just burning it. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I was, in, I was in architecture, and then I just, I, I kind of wanted to work with my hands more, and so I just looked for things like that, and someone took a chance on me, I had no experience in, uh, in painting or anything, but uh, I think it's more about really than, because there's hardly anyone who has experience in bike painting, it's such a crazy little niche. So, um, I mean, you can pick people that have like, experience in automotive painting. I've experienced that kind of where jobs try to look for those people, and that doesn't always work either because it's a very different, very different thing. It's just a whole different scale. Um, so, um, usually, I think it's just mostly about people who are meticulous and who just have a crazy attention to detail and just don't mind being driving themselves crazy. <laughs> because paint is very frustrating. You know? Everyone will tell you that. I mean, it's just it, it has a mind of its own sometimes. Like, I mean. It, a lot of times it does the right thing, but but no matter how, how long you've done it, things things do go wrong. So yeah. So, so if you're gonna like is it possible like if I wanted to try and paint a frame mm -hmm. in a garage or in a yeah. or something, is that is that possible to get like nice results? Or would you have to like Yeah, no, you definitely things? people do that for sure. Um it might not be like Kosher, you know, or to code or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, people do that all the time, I'm sure. So. Like, are there tricks to do it? Like... Uh, I mean, the main thing is just cleanliness issue. The reason people do it in booths and the reason I do it in booths, I mean, it's just companies do it there because it's just 
you're keeping that little box to be your little you know sanctuary, and it really is a sanctuary because Explosion. there's everything else out there. <laughs> <laughs> Explosion proof sanctuary, it's yeah. true. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so that that's the main thing I would think you run into is dust, totally, because dust is the enemy of paint, and uh, and you would see that, and I think that's what would be the main thing if you were painting it in a garage. Like I haven't really done. I remember like spray painting bikes in, in my bathroom. But, uh, <laughs> it's like kind of running out with my shirt over my face and like you know, running out and gasping for air. But uh, but yeah, you could totally, I mean, you could have one of these, you could still get ones like this and have a little mini compressor and people do that, definitely. Um, it's, it would just be a cleanliness issue. It would be much more frustrating and you wouldn't get the kind of uh, production. But I mean, I guess if you're in your garage, you don't care about that too much. So. I don't know what you mean about <laughs> dust proof or dust free in a well that garage either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. I mean, if you set it up right, I'm sure you could do it. But There's more polishing steps than you're accustomed to. Yeah, yeah, that could be it too. And there can be a lot of polishing, for sure. So. What do you, what do you polish with? Uh, so that would be a little buffer. Um, just like a little, usually they're just little guns, little um, buffing guns. Same kind of air fittings as this, it would just run off a compressor. And basically I would just take some, so after this was cleared, I would just look for all the little imperfections whether they be indentations from fish eyes in the clear, which happens when dust occurs a lot, um, which hasn't happened much for me, so. Or raised kind of surfaces, which are little, usually just little flecks of clear that just happen. It's just, you really know a way to avoid it. Um, you just, you can kind of minimize it. Um, so you would just sand down that wet sand with 1,000 grit. And then after that, you want to go to 2,000. Um, so either 1,500 or 2,000, 2,500, something really, really uh, fine. And then you just take that, you take a buffing compound, a rubbing compound, and then after that, you can also use another, like a polishing compound, with a different, um, a different little fitting, a different little pad, polishing pad, basically. Um, and then that's it. So, so you just go through the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> but, and then you're finally done. And then obviously after, before polishing or after polishing, either way, you can uh, I'll, I'll remove the masks from all the bare metal areas, um, which is also a very kind of, it's the same kind of process as unmasking uh, vinyl. So, so you just want to be really careful and kind of go in the direction of what you're doing. Do you spray flip coat the uh, bare metal or? Um, oh no, this is never, okay. no, no. I mean, you could, I suppose, but not, not this. You couldn't do this because it's so polished and you need, that's not another thing before you, uh, before you prime, you want everything to be really coarse, basically. So you would either sand it or sandblast it. So you want everything that you're so painting to be... too polished for it to stay, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you would never... Nothing would ever stick to this. That's the whole thing with paint. Like, this, that primer, this primer sticks to anything. Small children... Animals, <laughs> like, that stuff is crazy, but... Uh, but um, yeah. 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 So, like, the plugs on the seats, seats days, for example, Mm -hmm. If they're extremely high polished, then your masking doesn't have to be high detail because the shit's not going to stick to there anyway. Um, well, it's, it, you do want to be, you, you want to be right on because, I mean, nothing will stick to this, but it's going to stick to everything around it. Because <laughs> basically, I will stick, um, I'll put the mask on before I blast the bike. You have like a little oval shaped sticker that... Oh yeah, like oh yeah, happen. yep, yep. So I put that sticker down, then take it to the sand blast here. So then everything right outside of that gets blasted. So then you have that edge, so definitely. Right. So you want that nice clean. So that's why you have to have a vinyl that's, has, that keeps that nice edge and it's not gonna get frayed. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So, and that's a tricky thing too, depending on what kind of blast media you have or whatnot. So you wanna keep something that, you know, have something that keeps that edge, a nice, nice edge, so. Yeah. You, and, and part of the process, do you um, coat the inside of the frame? Too, is that else? No, that's that's somebody else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's this stuff called frame prep. Uh, and there's a number of ways to approach this, but basically, yeah, we plug it all off and we put it in a stand just like that. Mm -hmm. And we use mostly aerosol. And we'll, we'll turn it around just like he's describing and blow it with aerosol until the whole environment inside the tube is like soaked up with something really basic. It's usually not intense. A lot of times it's paraffin based. Yeah. Is that something we only do at a shop? Or um, you know, don't we? Yeah, no. <laughs> Frame builders rarely will, will, will mm. do that kind of prepping. It's a 
important with the steel frame like that to include in your, especially in this climate. Uh -huh. really, 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 <laughs> that thing is a multi thousand dollar investment, right? And if you don't prep the inside of it, it could deteriorate from the inside out. So, like, if you have a frame that like somebody else had forgotten to do that to, and it may have been out of elements, like, could you still do it retroactively? And we do that all the time in the bike shop, like, uh, with, with retro bikes and things, yeah, it's hard to determine what kind of damage may have already occurred, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, but, but, but totally. But so it's it slow as anything that's yeah, happening. Exactly. So it's an oxidized reaction, right? So if you seal it off, it'll slow down. So when you get your hands on a vintage steel frame, yeah, the first thing I'll do is like start shoving paper towels into the head tube and the seat tube and the bottom bracket, and then take my little aerosol with the plastic tube, you know, and go in every little hole. Starting with the uh, um, the water bottle right down the stair, mm -hmm. just like flooded out with an aerosol uh, of some kind of seasonal. Usually, I use Bow Shield T9. Uh, mm -hmm. Wait. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. From there to the bike shop, and then they deal with it and get it to the <laughs> customer usually. So, do you do any any side work right now, or are you just pretty much busy with? Um, yeah, pretty much busy with this, but uh, I do have side work as well, doing stuff like like this, jewelry and whatnot. So lots of other fun things to, to paint and. Do you have a website for that? Uh, yeah, there is a website. I think it's on the whatever. Yeah, it's on there. Too. Yeah, okay. it's on there for sure. So there's a little portfolio on there. So I like to. It's fun to dabble in other things as well. Definitely, because if you just do one thing, you go crazy. Yeah. Um, so the island is like essential for doing like fire and mist or what really yeah, from the definitely like as far as and this is an ice gun so that it, it has that basically atomization fine atomization of the of the particles so you want that uh, to not be too coarse some of the cheaper guns will just get more coarse kind of flakes of color that kind of just spit out there so this one's just really good at being fine about it because um, otherwise which, which you can see in something like this especially, this blue is extremely fine and there's so much metallic in it that you can see every little imperfection and, uh, and if you didn't have a nice gun you would definitely see some ugly, ugly flakes in there. So, so it's important for that kind of thing for sure. And, that's, and it's also important on how you adjust it for each separate circumstance. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it gets to be that way and sometimes you have it the wrong way and you have to correct yourself and yeah. You just kind of feel it as you go. Yeah, definitely. This really is what it is. There's really no way to. It's it, that's the toughest part about learning too. Something like that. You, you kind of teach someone. You don't. You really can't tell them. At the beginning so. of the session, will you spray it on something else to try to get a feel for yourself? Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to go. Like a piece of cardboard. You should probably do that more. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's that's something, especially to see the the fan shape. Yeah. For sure. If you find some like major, like you you've been painting for a little bit, and you find some major imperfection mm -hmm. in it. What do you do? Um, well, at different stages, it's different. But um, so for primer and stuff, for primer, you don't really care because afterwards you can just sand it uh, if you have to. Normally, you, know, you, know, you don't want to, but uh, you can easily sand that down. Um, any drips or runs or anything. Usually, you're going to sand down the primer anyway because any little, any little dust particles you want to just get it so it's uh, nice and smooth, basically for the color. Um, so you'll always go over that anyway, so you can get it then. Uh, the color, if you have a problem in that, um, you just want to sand it out usually. after Maybe after, so I, I'm blowing off after the first coat or something and I see some dust in there. Uh, you could just color it up with more color depending on how bad it is. If it's really dark, I could just sand it out really lightly with some 800. And then, once it's dry enough to sand that is, and then just put, keep going. With the clear, is the toughest one. Because um, you'll, you'll get stuff in there if you get like an ugly, especially on a, it, very much depends on the color too. Um, if it's like a white frame, and you get you're gonna get some everything you're gonna see. You know, if it's if it's a black frame, you're not gonna see anything. So you don't really care. You're probably getting just as much dust on that black frame, but you just don't notice it, and no one's gonna notice it, so it doesn't matter. But if it's a white frame, it's just that's when your booth being painted is really important. And then you can go in with some little piece of tape and kind of pick it out. Um, so we end up having to do pick it out, and then kind of putting some more clear over it to kind of level that if there's going to be a little indentation there. So, so that's never fun, but that's what happens. So. But yeah, that's about it. Do you still ever, or is there ever something you're interested in painting on? Um, uh, I mean, I, 
do I like to do printmaking. Five more than <laughs> body paint could be fun. I hear this That's true. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, no, I actually haven't done much other painting, to be honest, as far as like fine art kind of painting. I, this was really the first painting I really did. I mean, I'm not very good at watercolors or acrylic or anything, but I dabbled before, but, uh, but no. Is there a Tupac t-shirt? <laughs> SpongeBob Tupac t-shirt. So that's, that's my idea. So. <laughs> kind of meld the two together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually serious. Like, yeah. I'm not actually serious, but... <laughs> <laughs> You'll see. So. so yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Oh, <laughs> so everyone, everyone kind of pulls a look at this or whatever. Um, touch it as much as you want. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> everybody come up and check things out a little bit more. Um, just real quick, I want to talk about Next Curiosity Club. It's uh, June 26th with uh, Julia Barbie. It's entitled Olfactory Animalic. She will be presenting a series of perfumes that she's created ex explaining fragrance composition based on her novice artistic approach of air experimentation, an axis of sense, documents of text and verbal reactions, and intuition. Attendees will have the opportunity to experience scent ingredients and then see how their olfactory knowledge allows them to newly identify them within blends. A brief overview of the history of perfumery, Julia's work with pheromones and moths, and the bibliography will also be made available. So yeah, it's gonna be awesome. That sounds good. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I was like, uh, I think that was supposed to happen a while ago, right? Um, no, but she. I thought they were. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. Didn't we discover? Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, they are actually, because sometimes there'll be little uh, imperfections in their little pin mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, that's just good. Is there anything special about this material? <laughs> um, yeah, that's the one that's supposed to be good for water based so it's, it was actually developed yeah. for... Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if, say if I want to get some of these made for the project, yeah. 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 Um, I thought I could do it through mine, but I'm, I'm sure there are. Yeah. 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 All, all you need really is no. Yeah. 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 So just depending on the construction materials, sometimes there are little holes in the water and bloody dark out here. What would you call this if you're looking for the bigger one? 